Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. True or false, Jews did not go to the Catskills. True. At least in the early years of the 20th century, they were not welcome. Just one of the many fascinating things to learn in this new book, The Catskills, Its History and How It Changed America. Co-author Stephen Silverman is here with stories of the poets, gangsters, politicians, preachers, outcasts, and rebels of the Catskills. Next. Happy to welcome to the program author Stephen Silverman. This is a marvelous, marvelous book. Thank you, Tony. Many great characters, and we'll talk about uh, many of them. A and at least one surprise, this, this idea that the Catskills are anti-Semitic. It was a great bastion of anti-Semitism. The Catskills really didn't get going. I mean, there were farmers up there, yeah. the Dutch, and it was first spotted by Henry Hudson. In, you remember him in I've 1609. He was looking for India, but he instead found Albany. Well, uh, well, <laughs> that's a poor social. Yeah, but on the way to Albany, and then when he had to turn around and come back down the north, what was then the North River, he saw these purple mountains, and there, it was all recorded in his journal. Anyway, there was very little development there. What really got the Catskills going it was 1825. The Catskill Mountain House was built. Right. And it was a beautiful Federalist structure. Uh, really, go how they got the lumber up there is a mystery, even. But you know, it was to get the region going, and it got a lot of publicity. It, it was so famous that Thomas Cole, this young guy, was nothing, a painter, painter yeah. went up there to, to you know, because he'd heard about the Catskills. Um, but they had a, a very strict policy. It was only for rich people, number one. And you went there. You didn't just go for the weekend you went, you, your family would pack, you went with the trunks and you went with your servants and everyone checked into the hotel. But one of the things that the hotel demanded, and it was sort of a policy that would hold up there, was mandatory church services every Sunday. Really? Well, that instantly excludes, that's a polite way of saying no Jews. But there were impolite, if you yes, will, it ways, then got too, to be blatant. Signs. I mean, no dogs, no Jews, no. Hebrews will knock vainly for admission. It would not only be signs in the hotels, it would be advertisements in magazines. The, uh, it was no secret. The New York Times covered the anti-Semitic anti wave in the Catskills mm. in the 1800s. Finally, though, in the, what, 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s? Well, what, ha what happened, uh, there was a great change. I mean, the Catskills did become popular amongst the, the basically wealthy wasps. They had estates up there. The ones who weren't so rich that they could stay in the fancy hotels uh, would stay in boarding houses. But, you know, again, the same policies held. What happened was in the 1890s, first in Switzerland, in Davros, uh, tuberculosis was rampant throughout the world, especially mm -hmm. in New York, on the Lower East Side. And doctors here in New York thought, well, the way you treat tuberculosis, send the patient to warm climates down south. Instead, it was discovered in Switzerland first, cold mountain air would reverse the disease. So sanitariums opened in the Adirondacks, and the air was tested in the Catskills. And Catskills air was just as good as Adirondacks and that much closer to New York. Exactly. So the consumptives were riding on trains <laughs> with the <laughs> rich wasps, as I like to call them. And it was then discovered that tuberculosis wasn't genetic, as had previously been believed, but uh, contagious. So the guy coughing next to you. And, and people were dying in hotels and being smuggled out in the middle of the night with the arrangements between hotel managers and the funeral parlors. Anyway, so people abandoned the hotels and their estates even, and the boarding houses, and real estate prices in the Catskills plummeted. You know, this is starting about 1900, and real estate prices plummet, so guess who moves in? The Jews. And they thought they could be farmers, like many of them had been in the old country before they moved to New York and started working in the garment district on the Lower East Side. The problem with being a farmer in the Catskills was, 
the, the soil was all, all rocks. Nothing would grow. But you could put chickens on the land. And you could put cows on the land. You could right. get butter and eggs and feed people and give them fresh air and open up your house to borders. And thus it began. The Borscht Belt. And the Borscht Belt Borscht began. Borscht was born. Yes. Uh, there are so many great characters in this book, which I imagine was catnip for you because yes, of that's... your background as a uh, writer for right. an editor for People magazine. Right. used to be. Uh, let's talk about some of these people. Dutch R Schultz. God uh, bless him. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe his... His millions are still buried in the cast. Well, that's house. one of the stories in here. The legend of his lost right. uh, it, it, yeah, it, the le millions. His last days sort of play out like a scene in The Godfather. He was gunned down in a restaurant uh, with his cronies. And uh, he was in a New Jersey hospital. And as he's dying, his fever just start, climbs. And he's hallucinating. And he's spilling the beans about this money left in Sullivan County. And then there was word that one of his henchmen had a, the treasure map. And so he was found and gunned down in a barber shop in Manhattan. Again, right out of the Godfather. The, and they took the treasure map. They look at it and they said, this makes no sense. And it was either burned or ripped up. But the search began. Dutch Schultz was up there. Yeah. And, and, and because so, they were hideouts. They were right. great places. That and so many and other ga gangsters yeah. because of prohibition. Right. And uh, Legs Pro diamond. Prohibition did so many wonderful things for this country, I including, I guess, populate the Catskills with people like uh, Dutch, Schultz, Legs Diamond. Legs diamond. Lu His Lupke, brother Buck, was up there. Buck, Hal Buck Halter? Yeah. Louis Lepke. Lepke. Legs Diamond. Well, uh, uh, another story in the book that I love is that... Um, uh, Schultz was uh, indicted on a tax rap, federal thing. There's a trial in Malone, I think yeah. it is, New York. Yeah. And he had, in effect, bought off the whole town. I mean, not with actual dollars. These but guys were like Robin food. Hood up there. Yeah. Legs Diamond would hand out food baskets at Thanksgiving. Some woman lost her house in a fire and he bought clothes for the entire family. You know, mind you, he's going around killing people. And he, his other great public service was he was in Accra because his brother yeah. had tuberculosis. Town had, of Accra. Who had moved there for, for the air. Uh, but that Schultz, you know, his distillery was up there. But also they had fire hoses throughout the town uh, pumping beer into the restaurants. <laughs> and I think actually the fire hoses still exist. Beer has come over. You can, the get, you can get beer Luckily. in other ways, uh, fresher beer. One of the people you seem to be fascinated with, I mean, you're fascinated with all of them, but uh, Jenny Grossinger. Yeah. What a woman this, yeah. this woman is, and the, the portrait you paint of her. I mean, first of all, for a woman to be a successful business right. woman in, in that age, right. I mean, that just didn't it, happen. It's a true Hor Horatio Alger story, only she was, she was a woman. She was an immigrant. She came to this country. She had to leave school at nine uh, to help her family make money. Uh, she worked in uh, um, a uh, garment. Uh, she put buttonholes into men's coats. Her girlfriends weren't as lucky. They went to work at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Oh. But then Jenny was plucked out of uh, the garment district by her family when they tried to run a dairy restaurant in the Lower East Side. That didn't catch on in a butcher shop. But in the dairy restaurant, she developed these wonderful social skills. She was very charismatic. Um, she remembered people's names and what they did and, you know, their, their relatives. Yeah, she, and, gre she right. you're right that she greeted all the guests. And it remembered blossomed. Remembered their names, the, yeah. remembered the kids, right. remembered the birthdays. Right. And also, this was a woman, she greeted the guests. She, she, her name was on the hotel. She milked the cows. Yeah, right, right. She was I always, mean, a, I've been on a book tour, and, and people come up to me while I worked at Grossinger's. Jenny Grossinger would sit and eat dinner with us, with really? the staff. Yeah. Nobody had an unkind thing to say about her. I mean, I, I, I did find some guy who complained about, uh, you know, they, the workers struck for bigger wages. And she went into the kitchen and said, look, you know, don't disrupt anything. We'll take care of it. And he said, but, you know, the next season we weren't invited <laughs> to come back to work. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the only negative thing I could find. People adored her. She reminded me 
I'm a later arrival to New York, of Elaine Kaufman, who ran Elaine's. Ah, uh, someone I knew I quite, figured, I knew her yeah, quite Elaine well. Elaine was Elaine. charismatic, not educated, not a great conversationalist. No. Jenny uh, did take French lessons and Spanish lessons, but she wasn't, no, she couldn't tell a joke, you know, but everyone wanted to be in her presence. As, as they did with Elaine. She, right. She was just, she was a magnet. Right, her. exactly. Uh, is it because of Jenny that Grossinger's becomes, at least to me, one of the, yeah. the most well, famous Well, largely. Hotel? I mean, it, it ran on her personality, but also it was a very efficiently run organization by her, run by her husband behind the scenes. Uh, but, you know, she would go to other hotels on the eastern seaboard and learn their secrets. That's why the gentlemen had to wear coat and tie at dinner at Grossinger's. And they were always upgrading the facilities. Whatever they had, even during the Depression, they poured back into the business. Mm. And, up, you know, putting in an indoor pool, an outdoor pool, <laughs> indoor tennis court, outdoor tennis court. There was not an indoor ski slope. But, um, but they would tint the snow. That started in 1952. <laughs> Designer colors on your ski slope. It, Grossinger's, it was pink. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was Fantasyland. It was Disneyland before Disneyland. Well, it, you quote, I think it, 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 you quote in the book, Mordecai Rickler, the, the uh, uh, Canadian right. writer, is calling grossing as Disneyland with Canisius. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wonderful description of the place. Um, it was world renowned. Yeah. I, you know, even uh, hotel owners in Europe would come and see it. And, it, you know, yes, it was predominantly Jewish. But, you know, she was great friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Jenny was. She was great friends with Nelson Rockefeller. She didn't discriminate what political party. Uh, <laughs> big of her. And uh, it was just, I'm very sorry I never experienced it. Oddly enough, uh, just last month, I was at a book signing in Narrowsburg. And uh, coming back to the city, I overshot the highway, and I pulled into a random driveway. And of all the driveways in all the world, fate, it was Grossinger's. Really? So, yeah, the sign is intact. There's a big chain link fence. And I looked at the rest, the rest looked like the set of the Twilight Zone. There was Jenny's cottage, very decayed, uh, lead paint, peeling off of it. It was sad. And the towers, very 60s towers, but the windows were wide open. So you can imagine with the years of mold and whatnot. But I just thought, you know, I can f now honestly say I've been to Grossinger's. Mm. It, I, I love the philosophy. Was it hers or was it just general? Uh, uh, guests will never be hungry oh. and will never be bored. That, yeah. that was yeah. the... Well, that was the pervading... First of all, you had very discriminating guests, or at least those who liked to criticize, <laughs> no matter whether they were paying top dollar or pinching pennies. I can say it. I'm Jewish. You know, we're critical. <laughs> right. And, the, you know, and the entertainers, what they had to go through, because you had audiences sitting there. You know, we know the punchline before you're going to say it. But, you know, they, the were, cuss, tough, they were tough crowds. Impossible. Every comedian yeah. who's ever been on a talk show yeah. uh, who worked the Catskills, and they all did, right. talk about how tough those yeah. audiences were. Well, they like to brag who they walked out on. You walked out on Henny Youngman, I walked out on Red Fox. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yet, yeah, the customer came first. And, and, you know, it was always so you would come back again and again and again, and people did. It was also the food was such a big draw, and it was nonstop. Right. Wasn't great, but it was nonstop. Well, I hear, yeah, varying... Well, to feed that many people, how? Yeah. But well, on this on this point of entertainment, there were there was a, there was something called tumblers. Right. And you can tell us what a tumbler is, but right. I'll tell the audience one of the most famous tumblers was a fellow named Mel Kaminsky, who has gone on to greater fame as Mel Brooks. And he was fourteen when he was up there. Yeah. And he would, and he wasn't in a four-star hotel. He was, a, he was a schlepper. Uh, his routine was, he, he said, a tumbler. Uh, it's, 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 there are various derivations. People think it comes from tumult because you know, they cause hubbub, right. and he, you know it's to keep the audience entertained. And Mel Brooks said, you know, it's the job of the tumbler to be entertaining, preferably before breakfast. Um, <laughs> but it would go on all day, and then at night they would have to play matchmaker. 
And if they didn't play matchmaker, they at least had to dance with the single girls. And usually it was the ugly ones who were still left standing. I shouldn't say that. That's sexist. I take that back. But it was not. Awesome. Mel's routine was to run out. <laughs> And it was, remember, it was 14, and to this day, he's not very sh tall. So he had a, on a big overcoat, and he had uh, two suitcases weighed down with rocks and say, oi, business is terrible. And he'd just fall into the swimming pool as if drowning. And the thing was, he couldn't swim, and he was like, oh, my goodness. So they would have to jump in and oh save him. Of course, he embellishes his story, and I think probably, I probably just embellished it even more. But... Uh, he came out of that discipline. Woody Allen came out of that discipline. Sid Caesar was discovered up there. He wanted to be a saxophone player. He was at the Avon Lodge, which was owned by the uncle of the woman he eventually married. And in between playing the saxophone, he would break, he would do these nonsensical, brilliant routine. He, you know, people said that all the other comedians from the other hotels would come see this crazy guy they were hearing about who would stand on stage and make airplane propeller sounds. He was incredible. Steve, yeah. uh, Sid Caesar, I, I'll, I'll never forget your show. If you're, yeah. What yeah, a no, moment. No. Some other people. Yes. Uh, there's a marvelous picture in the book of a very tall, very tall yes, African-American yes. young man who is... He's a bellhop. He's a bellhop, and At his Kutcher's. name is? <laughs> Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain. And Mrs. Kutcher treated him like a son and made him drink his milk, and it certainly worked. It was, what, what was he, <laughs> seven, two? The joke, well, not joke, the legend was he was so tall that if your room were, were on the second floor, you just open the window, and he'd take it out of the car and pass it the, to you. The, the luggage. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I wonder how many fans of... <laughs> Basketball, know that Will Chamberlain he was a bellboy in the Cats I, You even have a mention in the introduction of a fellow, I mean, you, you borrow it from the Times, but of a fellow named Mark Carr, a farmer whose claim to fame apparently is... His crops failed, rocky soil, so he cut down some pine trees, took them to what is now Tribeca, sold them on a street corner, and that were, those were America's first Christmas trees. From the Catskills. From the Catskills. Well, you mentioned... Um, the painter earlier Thomas and Cole. Thomas Cole and one of the things I mean the title of the book is uh, the history of the Catskills and how it changed America and uh, one of the things Thomas Cole in effect began was the the, the Hudson River School of Painting began with right him the f in the which is the first American school of painting up until that time everything we did we were borrowing from England you know we wanted to act just like they were mm. despite the fact we fought very hard for our independence, as I was taught in school. Yeah. Um, he was the first. He had many followers, and it was a whole brand new style, all devoted to nature. It all started in the Catskills. It was the treatment of light, as only it could be found in the Catskills. It opened up travel, British travel writers. I mean, impressed by Thomas Cole and his, the others, would come over here and marvel at what they certainly didn't have in England. Mm. And uh, it eventually faded out because of Impressionism, but it held on a long time. It, at the time, it was not, not even called the Hudson River School. It had no name. It was just considered painting. And literature started up there. We had sh short story. Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle. Washington Irving. And uh, James Fenimore Cooper. The last of the Mohicans, I grew up in... California. I, as a kid, I thought, you know, I heard the title, Last of the Mohicans. Well, that must take place in the Wild West. That's where Indians are. Last of the Mohicans takes place in the Catskills. That was America's frontier. Its first frontier. That's how we, <laughs> that's how it we was, cling to the t subtitle. It was a, it was America. a frontier uh, on other levels, and I was um, uh, particularly interested in one. It was a refuge for, in the 40s or 50s, I guess. It was a refuge for gay men. There was a place called Casa Susana. Yeah, they were actually, and they were not necessarily gay. They were simply men. Cross-dressers? Who, like, who were cross-dressers. Right. And they were married. That's not to say they weren't gay. But it wasn't a sexual thing on that <laughs> Physically sex. It, it was the gratification of dressing, which was against the law. Of course. Uh, but, and this was a refuge. I yeah. Mean, yeah, it was an open who had this Right. Uh, preference. Right. Could go there, could go and, there. And, and not be 
afraid. Discriminated, right. Mm -hmm. But just as there were nudist colonies up there, just as, you know, the gangsters hid out there. It was always a refuge. The first African-American resort was run by Peg Leg Bates, yeah. one-legged tap dancer, uh, who supposedly was on the Ed Sullivan show more than anybody. But, I mean, he was a character and very well-known, very, again, very charismatic. And it, it was... You know, har churches from uh, Harlem, the buses would go up there even for just the day for picnics. Uh, but you could also stay there just like, you know, as if you were staying at Grossinger's. He was once asked, you know, how do, you know, how do the neighbors feel about your being here? He says, well, it's a little, little rocky at first, but now everything's kosher. <laughs> Bless you, Peg Leg. Bless you, Peg Leg. Father Divine. Wonderful guy. <laughs> what? Yeah. I'd never heard of him. And then I started digging in. He was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, he took on Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> um, he built, he, he was he, a utopian. He ran a lot of his, yeah. whatever you call them, up in the The Africa. communities were up there. He, they were never in his name. His followers, you know, he skirted taxes. Eventually, New York State banned him from being here. But he would go up on Sundays because you couldn't sur subpoena anyone on a Sunday. And he would deliver his sermons up there. Uh, but he fe during the Depression, he got his toehold and he would feed people. No one ever knew where his money came from. But his parishioners would just give and give and give. He had major community. They, his flock, as he called them, they, he wanted to be called God. And they, they called some of their communities heaven. But they took, would take over ta entire towns in the Catskills and run the hardware store. And, and it, it was an amazing character. Again, only in the Catskills. In the, in the end, he, he was, his church still exists, by the way. Uh, and it's run by uh, Mother Divine. His, actually, his second, much, she was a much younger wife. Mm. Um, and uh, he was run out of New York and uh, the headquarters of Philadelphia. Stephen, how did, the, how did the book come about? <laughs> I was always curious about the Catskills. Um, Judith Christ was a friend of mine, the movie critic. She had a house in Woodstock. In fact, she had a, at one point, she and her husband had a geodesic dome up there designed by Buckminster Fuller. But I would go and say, you know, where are all these resorts I've heard of? But mo most importantly, my editor at Knopf, Victoria Wilson, has a house near Calicoon. And she said, Stephen, you would be amazed the stories up here. And I said, well, you know, I barely go to Central Park. Uh, I'm a city boy. She said, nonetheless, there are a lot of characters. And when and she said characters, I, I knew she meant lunatics. And if they're lunatics, I'm interested. <laughs> and I found a whole string of them. I said, Vicki, okay, we'll do this. And this was, was it supposed to be a companion to a documentary? Yes, that, uh, Joan Micklin Silver, wonderful film director, and in fact, dear old friend of mine, uh, she did Hester Street and Crossing Delancey. Right. She yeah. and her husband were going to do a documentary on the Borscht, uh, uh, first on the Borscht Belt, then they expanded. So they did some interviews, but there was no book there, and Vicki arranged for me to get those transcripts, and at the end, once I had the, the book, I wove in what some, some experts had to say. Yeah. That, that formed the collaboration. And the, the film... Was it never made. Was it Ray just died abandoned? in 2013. No. So, and she didn't. Joan didn't want to no. pursue it. No. We hear periodically, every generation or so, maybe the Catskills are coming back. Are they coming back? They're back. They're back. They're back. Uh, Even I, without gambling. Even well, gambling's coming. Well, that, what that's going to do, I mean, look at Atlantic City. Yeah, killed. Yeah. Well, I, I can't say killed. Well, Atlantic City was pretty dead anyway, but... Right. But well, this isn't going to be the boost in the arm. I, I mean, what's working up there are bed and breakfasts. They're, you know, microbreweries. It's a smaller scale. These aren't, you know, these aren't these fortress resorts that existed at one time. But because the property values are reasonable and the Hamptons are overpriced and overrun, people are building even multi-million dollar homes up there. I mean, the Catskills are hot. The New York Times last year, if you just go through their weekend suggestions, there was always at least one, if not more, recommendations to go to the Catskills. Condé Nast Traveler listed it as one of the top 15 sites to visit last year and this you know this year there's even more up there and then you know, they're happening so it's becoming a, a mecca of well you can uh, we, meditate we, up there <laughs> yeah. 
There are a lot of ashrams. Really? Yeah. So meditation. But it's, bed and breakfast, I mean, it's becoming a sort of, I, I think of communities up the Hudson. Anyway, right. The Catskills right. are not really up the Hudson. Right. Uh, you know. Like, up and over. Yeah, <laughs> up and over. I mean, you, you have so many on the Hudson that are um, little, wonderful little communities. I'm not, I'm trying to think of some of the names. Well, right Rhinebeck. Now. Uh, Rhinebeck, uh, Rhinebeck. Uh, But there's Phoenicia, there's Narrowsburg. There are all sorts of wonderful places up there, and they're growing. I mean, you know, this, <laughs> this art gallery I, where I was signing books in Narrowsburg, it also fronts as a real estate office, and it tells you something. Are you... You sounded a moment ago when I mentioned gambling a little bit concerned that it isn't going to be the it's not the economic cure-all, right. cure which it has never been in wherever it goes. I mean, outside yeah. of Las Vegas. When the, the resorts were failing. I mean, they were been trying to get gambling into the Catskills for 50 years. Yeah. And when the resorts were failing because of a number of circumstances... It, it certainly it seemed, well, if we get casinos in here, these hotels are as grand as the ones in Vegas. They'll certainly accommodate slot machines. It seemed, you know, a practical thought. But as time has gone on, you can now gamble anywhere. It's no big deal. You can gamble on your telephone. Right. So you, what are they going to do? Are the, with the rebirth as you see it there, are, they, are the people uh, Happy about the prospect gambling is coming, or are they... Uh, the reading I get is very mixed. Really? Yeah. Some do look forward to it. There's no doubt about it. But I think the majority is, what do we need that for? Yeah. Well, New York City should be grateful for the Catskills for a number of reasons, not least of which is... Our water. This water, <laughs> which is used to be called the best in the world, or yes. best in the country, yeah. comes from there. It It does. We, we essentially stole the land so we could get it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but we were, look, it's not our fault. We, we weren't alive. <laughs> we did it. We're but, uh, and it is good water, and it still comes from there. And it, there, there was a risk posed by fracking, which could have polluted exactly. our water. And Governor Cuomo's put all that on hold. Yeah. He, so, so there, I, again, there, there's always drama in the Catskills, but it, it's the place for whatever reason has this remarkable gift for always reinventing itself. And as you say, uh, it's reinventing itself now, probably without m most New Yorkers realizing it. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, the book, The Catskills, It's History and How It Changed America. Stephen Silverman, thank you for being here. Uh, my treat, believe me. Thank you, Tony. And uh, we thank you for watching. We'll be back next week. Hope you will be too.